Here we are, we're moving into chapter 14 here, oscillations. And we said in the picture here, the main thing what we want to focus on with the oscillations are things that try to uh, lessen the blow or decrease the amount of force you might feel in that car. So the springs and the suspension and the shocks are what do that. So we want to analyze how those can dampen the forces that you actually feel. So we're back to springs again. And springs, remember, are elastic restoring forces. We know the equation from before as negative kx, x being the displacement from the unstretched length, and k being the spring constant that's unique to each spring. Some springs are tight, some springs are loose. It all depends on how they're constructed. We want to analyze spring forces, and you did that today in class, but we also want to look at combining springs in more than one orientation. So let's look at that. So the first thing we want to do is hook up springs that are right next to each other. We call this springs in parallel. So when you think about springs in parallel, both of those springs are lifting and they're both taking some of that downward force up. So the way I can do this is say that the force in the first spring, we'll call this spring one, call that spring two, plus the force in the second spring must equal the weight of the block. So we can just say that K1 x plus k2x equals mg. One thing we do know is that uh, spring 1 and spring 2 will stretch the same distance. So I can pull that out of my equation and leave behind a k1 plus k2 equals mg. And if I had a third spring pulling up, well it'd just be k1, k2, and k3. Solving for the distance of stretch, solving for the distance would just be the weight they're trying to hold up over k1 plus k2. What we call k1 and k2 is the effective spring constant, meaning those two springs could act as one spring if I replace them with whatever k1 plus k2 is. So if k1 was a 5 newton per meter spring and so was k2, I could replace them with just one 10 newton per meter spring and get the same result. So let's say I have one spring has a spring constant of 20 newtons per meter and I'm holding up a 10 kilogram mass. So just looking at that, if everything's at rest, the spring force must equal the gravitational force, which means that Kx must equal mg. And since I know the spring constant, I know gravity and the mass, the question would be how far does the spring stretch? So that would be 10 times 10 for your weight, or 100 newtons. We're gonna divide that by 20 newtons per meter, and my spring is gonna stretch five meters. But let's take two of those springs now and put them in parallel and holding up the same weight. So two springs in parallel here come down and hold up the same 10 kilograms. So I still have the same 100 newtons on this side, but this time we wanna know this stretch in the spring and the combined K constant is 40 newtons per meter. Because since they're in parallel, all I have to do is add those two together. So when I take 100 over 40 now, I get two and a half meters to be my stretch. So they only have to stretch half as much as they did the first time because both are now taking some of the weight for themselves. What we mean by effective K constant is if I could eliminate these two springs with one equivalent sp uh, spring that's just like the two individuals, I could replace this with one spring that had a 40 newton per meter K value and get the same exact answer. Another orientation we could have here is one spring attached directly to another spring in line with the weight hanging down underneath that. So those two springs are what we call in series with each other, and we want to see how we can find the effective K constant of two springs in series. What we want to do again is take both of those springs and try to replace both of those springs with one equivalent spring that will do the same exact thing as these two individuals. So what we can say is that if I look at that green spring, there is a total force that is upwards, and that total force upwards equals the force of gravity pulling down. Well, what is that total force made of? It's made of spring one and spring two. And since they're all in line here, what we could say is that spring one must equal spring two and must also equal whatever that total force is. So all the forces are now the same. 
which means that k1 and k2, x2, must be the same. So if we want to look at that total force again, that total force upwards would be the effective k constant if we replaced those two springs and made a new spring multiplied by stretch one plus stretch two. The two stretches are not equal this time because uh, each of the springs will stretch independently of each other. And if they have different k values, they'll probably stretch a little bit different as well. Right now I don't know x1 or x2, so what I can do is, like we always do, is substitute and solve. If I substitute in for x1, what I'm going to get is, is k2 over k1 multiplied by x2 plus x2. And what I can do is pull out the things that are in common there, which is the x2. So I'll be left with the effective k constant, k2, k1, plus 1 times x2. Okay, so what is that doing for us? We're trying to find what that effective k constant is. And what we've solved here for is the total force pulling up. But we know that the total force pulling up is equal to force in spring 1 and the force in spring 2 since they're all in line with each other. So if I want to get rid of x2, I'm just going to set that equal to force 2. And force 2 ends up being k2 x2, which now eliminates my x2 from both sides, and I can rearrange and substitute and solve. So if you are careful with your math, what you end up with is, is that k1 times k2 over the sum of k1 plus k2. So what does that do for us? Well, another way of writing this whole giant fraction equation here is writing that 1 over the first spring constant plus 1 over the second spring constant equals 1 over the effective spring constant, or the total spring constant. So let's see what that does with our problem that we did last time with each spring being 5 newtons per meter, and I put that into here. Each spring... Let's do that again now with the problem we did before, and each spring being 20 newtons per meter. So I'm going to put 1 over 20 plus 1 over 20 gives me my effective k constant. So a 20th and a 20th is 2 20ths equals 1 over k. And do not say that the effective k constant is 1 10th, because that is a common thing that people do miss when they try to do these problems that equals 1 over the effective k. So I've got to flip this side of the fraction and this side of the fraction, and the new effective k constant ends up being 10 newtons per meter. So having two springs in series actually gives you less of an effective spring constant than they were by themselves. So how is that going to change my problem? Well, our problem had two springs in series, and each spring is holding up the 10 kilogram mass. So there's a downward force of 100 newtons. And my new effective spring constant is the 10 newtons per meter being my new effective k constant, the new stretch is 10 meters. stretch we had last time. It stretches a lot more. It stretches twice as much as it did the first time. So there's how you can solve for springs in series or parallel. And like we saw in class, we can combine those into combinations of series and parallel and also get good predictions of how the springs will stretch. But why do we want to know this? Why do we want to deal with stretching springs? So the reason we want to know about springs and the forces that are involved is because to put things in simple harmonic motion now, all we have to do is move them a little bit more than they want to from their rest position and the springs start doing this. The objects will bounce back and forth, up and down. The objects could move left and right, just like that little thing I've had in the back of the room all year. Uh, we, could have, we could have anything that oscillates back and forth. That is something that we call simple harmonic motion. It's oscillatory motion, it's back and forth, it's repetitive. And what we can do is we can time things. We can time them for one complete cycle, or we could see how many cycles they get every single second, and we call that unit a hertz. So the hertz for a particular frequency tells you how many spins you would get for every single second of rotation. Or the reverse of that is the time just to complete one of the cycles. So a way to, way to write equations for time period and frequency that if you want to find a frequency, you take the number of things happening for every single time period. And if I want to solve for a time period, the time period 
is just the flip of a frequency. So if you increase the time period, you decrease the frequency or vice versa. So we've got those two relationships there for timing and finding how often things happen. And like we've seen many times before, the spring force is a restoring force that tries to cause objects to accelerate back to their resting spring length. They want the spring to go back to its unstretched length if possible, but if it's hanging up and down, it'll be happy to sit at that equilibrium point. So what do I mean by equilibrium? It's the point where there's no force on you whatsoever. We'll have springs moving back and forth. The X is the distance of stretch from that equilibrium point or compression. These springs may become compress and stretch or go both ways. So what we're trying to focus on is what happens when you move that mass away from equilibrium? Where does it want to go? What forces does it feel? And how does it move as it moves through an oscillation back and forth and back and forth? One thing we can say is that simple harmonic motion and circular motion almost look identical here. When something travels in a circular path, that motion can be seen as oscillatory, meaning that it does look like it goes back and forth and back and forth. So let me show you what I mean by that. So here I am holding that wheel, and you can see I taped a marker to the wheel. What I'm going to do is give the wheel some motion, and once the wheel is spinning here, I can see that I've got normal circular motion here. The marker takes a certain time to rotate around. We could time this, calculate the time period or the frequency for how quickly this marker is spinning. Now I've obviously slowed down time so that you can actually see the marker spinning. But if I take circular motion and I turn the plane, if I move that wheel and move it 90 degrees to the plane, I have the same motion going on here but now you can see the marker is on the far left side and now it's on the far right side. So it oscillates back and forth and back and forth and we can relate things that go in circles to th things like the spring and the mass. They look like they're almost the same thing happening at the same time, just in different planes. The marker is going left and right while the mass goes up and down. So we can make many analogies to circular motion and simple harmonic motion by calculating time periods, frequencies, and even something we'll call the angular frequency, which is how often it goes around its cycle and then how many radians per second. So tomorrow in class we will be calculating our angular frequencies and seeing how we can affect how quickly these objects move around the circle.